The role of gods in the modern world is explored in a fantastical manner by Neil Gaiman in his book, American Gods. Let's yak about that. American Gods is set in the modern day USA. Although unbeknownst to most modern people, a large number of ancient gods still walk the earth in human form. The general premise is that an individual god gains both spiritual and physical power through the faith and worship of their followers, and as they fall out of fashion and get replaced by other gods, while well, they don't actually die, they become diminished to the point of being indistinguishable from mere mortal humans. Pretty much all cultures from all periods of history all over the world have had their gods. And while the gods of Stone Age and Early Bronze Age humans are lost to the entropy of time, Neil Gaiman's theme is expressed very simply by one of these people from thousands of years in the past in a brief statement that is described later as being a blasphemous statement. Here is this human from the ancient past. Gods are great, said Atsula slowly, as if she were imparting a great secret. But the heart is greater, for it is from our hearts they come, and to our hearts they shall return. The gods who are characters in American gods are Odin and Thor from Norse mythology, Anubis and Osiris from ancient Egypt, and other deities from African and South Asian pantheons, the indigenous peoples of North America, and so on. The central conflict of this book arises as the last remnants of faith in these deities is being pushed out by the modern gods of media and computers and telephones, leading to the hints of a brewing revolution from the gods of old. Another theme that is explored throughout the book, particularly with the Egyptian gods of the afterlife, is the blurring between life and death. And even a couple of the human characters do some journeying back and forth between these two connected states. This is a discussion that the main character of the book, Shadow, has with an Egyptian deity on one of these journeys. But I am also, in one of my capacities, like so many of the people you have chosen to associate with, a psychopomp. I escort the living to the world of the dead. I thought this was the world of the dead, said Shadow. No, not per se. It's more of a preliminary. The boat slipped and slid across the mirror surface of the underground pool, and then Mr. Ibis said, without moving its beak, You people talk about the living and the dead as if they were two mutually exclusive categories, as if you cannot have a river that is also a road, or a song that is also a color. You can't, said Shadow. Can you? The echoes whispered his words back at him from across the pool. What you have to remember, said Mr. Ibis testily, is that life and death are different sides of the same coin, like the heads and tails of a quarter. And if I had a double-headed quarter, you don't. As you can imagine, this supernatural stuff creates some confusion for the humans who get caught up in it. Though not for Shadow, who, oddly enough, seems to never be surprised by any of it. I consistently felt that that was kind of weird in this book. But anyhow, the difficulties created by faith and belief are captured beautifully in a rather lengthy soliloquy by one of the side characters, during which she hits upon some really great truths, in my opinion. I can believe things that are true, and I can believe things that aren't true, and I can believe things where nobody knows if they're true or not. I can believe in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and Marilyn Monroe and the Beatles and Elvis and Mr. Ed. Listen, I believe that people are perfectible, that knowledge is infinite, and that the world is run by secret banking cartels and is visited by aliens on a regular basis. Nice ones that look like wrinkled lemurs and bad ones who mutilate cattle and want our water and our women. I believe that the future sucks and I believe that the future rocks and I believe that one day white buffalo woman is going to come back and kick everyone's ass. I believe that all men are just overgrown boys with deep problems communicating and that the decline in good sex in America is coincident with the decline in drive-in movie theaters from state to state. I believe that all politicians are unprincipled crooks, and I still believe that they are better than the alternative. I believe that California is going to sink into the sea when the big one comes, while Florida is going to dissolve into madness and alligators and toxic waste. 
I believe that antibacterial soap is destroying our resistance to dirt and disease so that one day we'll all be wiped out by the common cold like the Martians in War of the Worlds. I believe that the greatest poets of the last century were Edith Stitwell and Don Marquis, that jade is dried dragon sperm, and that thousands of years ago in a former life I was a one-armed Siberian shaman. I believe that mankind's destiny lies in the stars. I believe that candy really did taste better when I was a kid. That it's aerodynamically impossible for a bumblebee to fly. That light is a wave and a particle. That there's a cat in a box somewhere who's alive and dead at the same time. Although if they don't ever open the box to feed it, it'll eventually just be two different kinds of dead. And that there are stars in the universe billions of years older than the universe itself. I believe in a personal God who cares about me and worries and oversees everything I do. I believe in an impersonal God who set the universe in motion and went off to hang with her girlfriends and doesn't even know that I'm alive. I believe in an empty and godless universe of causal chaos, background noise, and sheer blind luck. I believe that anyone who says that sex is overrated just hasn't done it properly. I believe that anyone who claims to know what's going on will lie about the little things too. I believe in absolute honesty and sensible social lies. I believe in a woman's right to choose, a baby's right to live, that while all human life is sacred, there's nothing wrong with the death penalty if you can trust the legal system implicitly, and that no one but a moron would ever trust the legal system. I believe that life is a game, that life is a cruel joke, and that life is what happens when you're alive, and that you might as well lie back and enjoy it. Weirdly enough, the parts of the book that I had most trouble believing were some of the scenes that didn't involve any of the supernatural stuff. For instance, at one point, Shadow is flying in a commercial airliner that for some reason makes a brief stopover at a small regional airport where nobody is disembarking from the aircraft. Shadow decides spontaneously to leave the plane and simply walks off it, heading out to his next destination. There are a few situations like this that left me going, Okay, Neil Gaiman might be one of the most popular living fantasy authors in the world, but does he know how the real world works? So I thought it was funny that the most realistic stuff is the things that I found to be most unbelievable in this book. However, the author does manage to write some intentionally funny moments throughout a book that is full of deep existential confusion. At one point, Shadow is being guided through a forest by a large black talking raven, and he makes this request of the raven. The bird cawed again impatiently. Shadow started walking toward it. It waited until he was close, then flapped heavily into another tree, heading somewhat to the left of the way Shadow had originally been going. Hey, said Shadow, Hugin or Moonin or whatever you are. The bird turned, head tipped suspiciously on one side, and it stared at him with bright eyes. Say never more, said Shadow. You, said the raven. It said nothing else as they went through the woodland together. That part made me laugh. American Gods ultimately make some interesting statements about religion. At one point, a leprechaun character twists Karl Marx's famous quote to make it more tragically accurate to our modern society. Here he is talking. I can get out of here, said Sweeney. I can get away before the storm hits, away from a world in which opiates have become the religion of the masses. That's true enough, isn't it? And then later, the faceless narrator of the book has a much more direct statement to make about religion. One of the book's chapters starts this way. None of this can actually be happening. If it makes you more comfortable, you can simply think of it as a metaphor. Religions are, by definition, metaphors, after all. God is a dream, a hope, a woman, an ironist, a father, a city, a house of many rooms, a watchmaker who left his prize chronometer in the desert, someone who loves you, even perhaps against all evidence, a celestial being whose only interest is to make sure your football team, army, business, or marriage thrives, prospers, and triumphs over all opposition. Religions are places to stand and look and act vantage points from which to view the world. So, none of this is happening. Such things could not occur. Never a word of it is literally true. Even so, the next thing that happened happened like this. I do find it interesting that Neil Gaiman chose to leave out the more popular religious figures of the past couple of millennia, such as Jesus and Mohammed. American Gods was published in 2001 not long after the internet had changed the world. And the modern gods in the book are basically presented as information and technology. 
here in 2018, with non-religious people becoming the fastest growing faith group in the Western world, Jesus is starting to fall out of style. But what would the modern gods be if this book was written in 2018? Hold on. I think our gods would be ourselves. Hey, it's Josh. You know why I'm here. Sometimes you just need that friendly reminder to give a little thumb up, to subscribe to the channel, to share the video with somebody who would enjoy it. Thanks so much for watching. Cheers. The role of gods in a modern world ex However, the author does manage... Oh wait, I just said that. It consists of... American Gods is set in, mo the, in modern... A watchmaker who left his prize crone... Pretty much all cultures 